Hello there. Great you took the time to join me on my latest tutorial video for Thinking Particles. In this video, we will explore how we can use the massive parallel processing of MEL to create individual strands of splines and connect them into individual membranes. I also discuss how we can animate those membranes. I hope you will enjoy this free tutorial video and I can't wait to see what you will come up with. I'm your host Edwin Brown. So let's do this. Let's have a look here in our scene. The scene is made out of these circles already there. And I'm going to explain how we created these procedural circles based on our me al script. Let me bring up our thinking particles user interface. So what we have is two dynamic sets. We have the create dynamic set where we just draw particles in our 3D Studio Max viewport. And each of these particle serves as our center point. So that's the first thing we are going to do is draw some particles and wherever one particle is, that's our center point for our circle. And now to the MEL script. What I have here is the time interval. The time interval just says, okay, call this thing here only at frame zero. Or I could, call it for the next 100 frames or whatever I type in here. But for now, I just want to create the circles and uh, let them sit there. Let me bring up our script code, our MEL code. And what we can see here is we have in our first block, we use the definitions of our inputs. So I'll create an input position. So where we have the particles, the uh, particles we draw with our particle draw node, and we put those particles in the position group. So we have the input for the position group. So I can select any group I want. So my first input is the positions. My second one is the radius, the radius of our circle and number of circles I want to draw. We want to have concentric circles and the amount of particles on a circle. And the next one is our particles we actually create for our circle. We put those in an extra group called particles. So these are the inputs I created with this little block of code. And as a reminder, whenever you see a sample or want to explore uh, how things work, we ship Thinking Park 7.3 with hundreds of files and many, many examples in MEL. So that's also a rich tool or space where you can find how things are done. But whenever you're in doubt, let me just show you how you get information. You just click on any command you see here and then use the selective help. So that picks out now from the internet or local file, the help from our thing I just picked here, input description, and it explains the parameters and what it is meant for and what it can do. So keep that in mind. Anything you see here highlighted, you can ask with the selective help, what does it mean? Where is it used? And our manual has a rich description and examples. So let's continue uh, within our code. How did we do the circles? So the next thing we is, we do is we, we need some variables where we can modify values or store values. So I have a variable called position steps. That's the number of particles around our circle. That would be our particles per circle. That is this input here, particles per circle. So we define the variables so that we can work with the variables and do some things. And the next thing I'm doing here is I get particle data. So the particle data I get is the position. So that's this call here. I'm asking for the particle position. Now the question is which particle data? There is no particle. We didn't create any particles. Uh, that's not true because in our dynamics set, we already created some particles. We used a particle draw and I want these positions as my starting points for the circuit. So what I'm doing here is our first input in MEL decides which parts of the inputs is processed in parallel. So what we are having here is a massive parallel programming language. So the first input decides what is parallel and we are now going to 
through the positions in parallel. So this whole mi L is now centered around the position particles. And this is when I ask for a PID particle ID, it's automatically meant that's my first input. That's the data that's processed in parallel. So what I get now is from all the drawn particle positions we have here, the particles I draw here, we will get the particle position. So this function just fills in my particle position. Then I'll get the x-axis and the y-axis. For now, that's fine. We, we just want to have uh, the position with x and y. So I'm getting storing the uh, position zero, which is x on our position we uh, acquired here in the center x and then the center y variable, which we defined up here. And that's it. So now we have the position where we want to draw the circles and all the rest is simple math where we just uh, have a for a loop that draws X amount. So the amount is number of circles in. So that's our number of circles. So we have three circles. So our um, for loop, our first for loop goes uh, the amount of part, uh, circles we want to create. Then we have an inner loop where we have the amount of steps, which is our particles per circle. And that's practically it. And drawing a circle is, as I mentioned, simple math. You have a cosine and sine function, uh, the center point plus the radius. And then here in the last part, that's the most important part, we create a particle in our particle group. Uh, which is called group up here. So here we have it. That's our particle group. So in this group or whatever we picked here in this group, we create one particle. And then the loop goes through and there we go. We have our circles. And that's practically all we needed to do is get our positions from the draw. Let me just create a new one. That's the great thing. We can just draw particle positions, or you can spray them and use, or matter waves, or use the fluid dynamics. You can use any kind of particles. So let me just stop drawing. Let me just go back to frame zero. And there we go. We have our circles. And then on the other hand, we have all these parameters we just created. We can change the radius as we like, and we can change the number of circles we want to draw and the amount of particles around a circle. We can adjust it here. So that will be our base. Uh, let me just bring up the code again. So this will be my base for our fully procedural membrane we are going to draw now. Because right now what we have is just particles. And now I want to concentrate, how can we create a loudspeaker membrane, for example, and use the loudspeaker membrane. But the base for my next step in the tutorial will be this simple math, uh, cosine and sine, center position, radius, and that's it, and points in, in space. So this will be the base in my next step. So let me just bring up my next scene file and we can go and actually create our membrane and we will do some little additions to make this uh, a little bit more advanced. Here in this scene, we use the exact same principle we learned before. That's the concentric circles and it's the same base code. However, I did some modifications as you can see here. We have now uh, this arrow helper object and uh, we want to place with this arrow helper object our membrane. And, and when we zoom in here, we can see we now have this shape here. So not all of the circles are on the same plane. So it's stepping up and out. So let's have a look how we did that and how we actually got the arrow working. Because what is happening here is I want to control with this object, the position of our speaker 
and the direction of our speaker. So if I reset the simulation, frame zero, we can see it rotates our speaker, our membrane here in space, exactly where I point uh, this arrow. If I just undo that, we go back with the simulation, we're back with that. So the idea is I place as many arrows as I want in the position as I want, and on top of it, we can also do a scaling. So it considers the scaling of our helper object. So let me just shrink that down. I'll just reset the simulation and we can see it is taking the scaling from our arrow. So if I scale this app up and let's just go here, I'll go back, reset the simulation. We can see we get the scale and the rotation. So that's an important part. And uh, let's have a look how we did that. I'll just open right away the codes segment. And as I mentioned before, we're using the same principle as before. We have a radius, we have the number of rings we want to draw. And the modification is we have now a variable where we have the height step. So uh, each step is two units and we draw another uh, circle. Um, that's our radius step. That's the uh, radius increase. So we see that when we look from the front. And another variable is particles per ring. We had that before as well. How many particles around the circle? And we have a new option like for, for spline thickness. And we'll discuss this later. So first, let's have a look how we did this thing. Let me just move uh, the thinking particles out of the way so that we can concentrate on our shape of the membrane. So when we see here this shape, of our membrane. This was done with the value-to-value uh, -value input. So we created an input curve, that's the port function input, where we can communicate with a value-to-value. -value. Actually, what it does is we throw in a value and get a value back. So that allows us to actually draw, let me just move that here, the shape of our membrane. So I could just go in here and draw it like that, and we will get this kind of membrane. And if I move that, we get this kind of membrane. Just move it like that. So you get the idea. Now we can control the shape of our membrane. Oh, let's just do it something like that. Now we can just model the shape with any curve or or anything we want to draw like so, our membrane. So how did we do that? As I mentioned in our thinking particle setup, let me just bring that back in. We have uh, the input for our curve, the value to value, and our script is getting the value to value values and interpreting them as radius or position changes. So how did we do that? Let's have a look here. So besides the additional inputs that are pretty simple to create in MEL, uh, we added a few more variables we want to work with. Um, but let's concentrate now on how we did this, because in, the, in contrast to the example we did before, where we drew, drew particles in space, I'm just now getting from the object a list of objects, and the object list is empty. So why? We are just supplying the position group. So everything that's in the position particle group will become an object and fed into a list of objects. And we feed this position group automatically with a layer to particle. So in the arrow layer or arrows layer, we will have our arrow helper objects. So now the great thing about this is it's a fully procedural setup. So whenever I create another arrow, we will automatically have a new speaker. Let me show you what I mean by that. So if we were to just activate this here and just draw another arrow, let me just move one over here. And I'll just copy it there. So now when I reset the simulation, we suddenly have two speakers. And remember, it does automatically um, care about the scaling or 
consider the scaling of our object. But if I reset the simulation again, we have a smaller speaker now. And another great feature is we can have its position as well. So let me just move that just right underneath here. Or probably below is our base and that's our mid. And I'll just reset the simulation. And here we go. Now we have two speakers, two membranes. So that's the fully procedural approach. And let me just uh, recapture how we did that. So what we did here is we are using a layer to particle node that will automatically scan all the time the layer arrows. That's the layer name we want to scan. And I'm looking for objects called arrow with a star. That's a wildcat. Um, so everything that's called arrow will be used as an object inside here and creates a particle. And then we are feeding in the particle group into our object, and then we can access the objects in parallel. That's the beauty of it. Now we have full parallel processing of our data. So everything that's in here, if we have a thousand objects, they will all be created in parallel. That's the amazing thing we can achieve here. And it stays fully procedural. So now the only thing I have to do is place and multiply my arrows and we get automatically membranes in space. So let me bring up our script again. So how did we do that? So as I mentioned, the first entry, as always, is deciding what we are accessing with massive parallel processing. So the first entry is our object's input. So we call that speakers. We can call it whatever we want, but that's our first input. And this gets the objects. So that means everything we access now is considered or is done in parallel with the speaker's input or object's input. So we just tell the system now, okay, I want the speakers in parallel. So I won't go I want to go over my object list in parallel and all objects. So I'm not filtering here any objects. And we are getting all the objects here. Then I want to have a transformation. And this is the most important part so that we can track the position and scale and rotation. We are doing from the object ID that is actually in the multi-threading, in the thread that is working, is processed. So that's my object ID from this list here. I want to do a transform vector object. So that's my object space to world space. And I want to store that in a scale factor. So we give it a scale factor and it will be transformed into the size and scale and rotation of the original object of our arrow. So that's all the secret or the magic we need to do here to make sure that everything is in relation to our original object here. Then we do some spline thickness. We will uh, discuss that later. We don't need that right now. We just have points. And then here comes uh, the same stuff I already explained in the first part where we do our uh, sine and cosine calculations for the circles. But the only difference here we have is curve in value. So that's our curve input. That's the value to value where we take this value and just divide it by the amount of rings we go through and we add this uh, bending value or multiplier. So that is causing our bending. So based on the curve we have here, we are now modifying the positions of our particles. So that's all happening here. Uh, excuse me, happening here. And then we just do the normal uh, radius calculations for the circles. So we have two loops as we did before. And then we just set another bunch of um, positions and particles. We use the same transform where, we, again, we use the object ID. So the object, the, the arrow we're working on, we do the same for now points. We transform our points to the uh, from the object position or values to the world position. And then we calculate that. And we use the world position 
to actually place our particle here in space in relation to our arrow. So that's all actually what's happening here. And the rest is we store our original position. So where we created this PID1, that's the particle ID number one. Um, so here we create this new particle with our new transformed position in space. And this new particle ID, we remember its original position. And I'll uh, tell you why we do that later, because we want to get a vibration or a movement or motion like a speaker membrane moves. So we need to have always the uh, um, zero position or uh, where the there's no movement at all. So we need to store that and we store that along with the particle in a data channel. So the original data position is stored in a data channel. Then we can uh, store also our arrow. We want to know this point is actually uh, coming from this object or helper object or arrow. So we um, remember our object ID. So later when we want to access it, we can do uh, outside of this uh, script, we can do other stuff as well. And then we calculate the size of our um, particle and we set a size for the particle and I'll talk about it, uh, how we do that. So now the question is, how can we get a nice spline representation? Because I really want to have a spline representation of this membrane. So let's add some spline functions. And the spline functions are pretty simple and yet they're really powerful. So let's go in here. So to create a spline or prepare for some uh, spline operations, what we need to do is the following. We need to create or open a spline pool. So we already connected the spline pool node here and we created the input. So what I did here is I just say, okay, I want to create a spline now. So now the first memory or data pool is opened. So we get back a spline ID and I store that in the S ID. So now we can add spline knots. And when we can add spline knots, we can connect them. So now that I said, okay, I want to open up or create a spline. That's the first step we need to do. And then when we create our particles, we just need to make sure that along with the creation of the particles, let me just bring that in here, we are actually also creating the spline knots and um, it will automatically connect the splines with each other. So what we do here is we take our spline ID, we just created up here, as you remember, uh, where is it? Up here. So we say, okay, I want to create a spline. I get the spline ID back and I said, okay, at this position, this particle or point in space, add this particle to the spline. And as we add this particle to the spline, it will draw the splines around. And then the next thing is we, we use that later. I'm not going into depth with the color, vertex colors. We also set a vertex color for our spline knot so that we can, if we wanted to, uh, want to color it, we can color the spline. So what I want to achieve is while we are drawing with our for loop, first particle, second particle, draw a spline, draw a spline, draw a spline. So we draw a spline all around. So let's see if we achieve that with these few additions. And there we go. Here we have our splines. And the great thing is these are now standard splines. I can go into spline pool. I can adjust the thickness. So I can make them thicker. I can make them more detailed. I can do all kinds of things. These are now standard splines. So however, for a membrane to somehow visualize it even better, I would like to have the vertical lines as well. Not only the, the circumference, I want these vertical lines and horizontal and also connected. So how can I achieve that? How can I do that? What we need to do is actually 
we need to draw the same circles again, but connect in this direction. So whenever we connect these circles, we need to connect in this direction. So let me just bring up this stuff here and let's do the verticals. Let me bring in the code for the verticals. And the great thing is about NEL, it's a programming language, we can just copy and paste stuff. So what I did here, I copy and pasted our first circle, but all I did is I change around the X and Y axis. So now we are connecting the other way around. Everything else is identical. Create a spline, do everything. So I just flipped the axis. And what's happening now is as the line is drawn, I'm connecting this with this, with this, with this, with this, with this, with this, with this. So when we now reset our simulation, we can see we actually achieve what we wanted to achieve. Now we have these beautiful membranes drawn and we can also create, can get rid of our particles. We don't need to see them. Now we only have the membranes here. We have the membranes drawn really nice. So that's really easy. And, and the power, I hope you can uh, see the power in using MEL is we just copy and pasted one element we already had working. I flipped the axis in the code and that's it. All the rest stays the same. We don't have to think about circles. The circles is the same. So we are doing just another set of lines or splines and connect them. And it's so great and really powerful to get your effects done in a fully procedural way. And keep in mind, it's still fully procedural. If I add another arrow, we'll have another speaker here. Let me just show you. I'll just copy this arrow over here. Okay, we just reset now our simulation and there we go. And if I wanted to move this over here in the center, we can have it like this. I'll just reset the simulation, our calculation. Remember, our calculation is only done in frame zero. And now we have all this. So I told you or said we wanted to do the uh, um, vibration or animation of this uh, speaker membrane. So let me just um, enable this uh, MEL script and let's have a look what we did here. And again, this is really simple, easy, but yet so powerful. There's nothing really complicated going on. We just have to put a little bit uh, of thinking into it, but in, in, let me explain short what we are doing. So what we are doing here is we are looking at the particles. So we are trying to get the data channel of our particle where we get the object ID. If we don't have an object ID, we don't have to do anything. So if a particle is not part of our speaker, we just return and that's it. So the next thing is, if this is not the case, we just get the data channel where our original position is. And this is where I was talking about, we have to store the original position because we want to return from this position uh, to this position, or we want to use this position as our starting point. Now we do a sine wave and we use all the positions we get in right now from our particles and we have as a first input is our particle group. And this is our, let, let's see, group is set to particles. So all the particles here in the system will be used and uh, analyzed in parallel. So we go over all particles in parallel, all the points we had before, and we get the positions. So we get the position of the particle. And then, we do a little bit of calculations in the x-axis and y-axis. And then we do a little bit of our sine wave and do modifications and frequency adjustments so that it doesn't look too strange or too extreme. And then again, our favorite function is the transform. We always have to make sure we transform back from object to world so from our object space back to world, so that we are always in relation to our helper object, the arrow. 
and then we set the new particle position. And then we can always return back to our origin position because we start the origin position here. And when we now play back, we should have our speaker, loudspeaker membranes vibrating in a sine wave. And then again, this is just for the purpose of this tutorial. We can use control this by actual uh, a music controller or sound controller, or we can do all kinds of other animation effects here. But the great thing here is everything stays fully procedural. If it's a one speaker now or a thousand speakers, it's all fully procedural. And I'll show you a setup where we can use this to our advantage. So let me just load um, the next scene and I'll have a quick overview um, how we can use this fully procedural effect to our advantage. Okay, let's wrap this tutorial video up. Um, in this scene, I'll just show you how great it is when you have a procedural setup done. It's so powerful and easy to work with then because you don't have to care about anything else or the complicated stuff. So once set up, you can just replicate and reuse all these nice setups you've done. So what I did here is I actually built a loudspeaker or a speaker box um, where I put in my membranes. And if we animate them, let me just play back. We see they are already pumping out music. And what I did is I attached, let me just turn on the arrows we know from the other part before. So every one of these little speaker is uh, placed inside the box where it should be with the correct size or scale. And that's it. So I link them. So now when I move the box, everything moves along. So that's the really great thing. So now all I need to do is if I, we want to do a little bit of a sound experience here, I would just go ahead and select all the um, arrows that uh, go along with the box. Let me just go in here and we select all the stuff. I'll just move the box here and we'll duplicate it. Move the box here. Okay, we'll make a copy. Then we'll just go in here and rotate it around here. And then we'll let's just move it a little bit over here. So something like that. So now we have a new speaker set of speakers. Uh, we just need to make sure that our speakers that the arrows are in the right uh, layer, which they are because they got their original information from the speaker too. So now when I reset the simulation, we get our speaker here with all the membranes in there. And we can do obviously the same over here where we just go in here and select all our speaker. And I'll just do the same here. I'll just copy it over here. We'll make a copy, move the speaker over here a little bit, rotate the speaker towards the couch or sofa, and we'll move it in a little bit. And because we have, again, everything organized fully procedural, I just have to reset our simulation and the speakers are back, the membranes are back. And now, Whenever I rotate a little bit my speaker and we reset the simulation, the membranes rotate along. And now we can have as many speakers as we want. Whatever we want to do, we can do that. And we have all the speakers now in sync animated. Let me just go in here. Let's animate them. So they will be vibrating. Sorry, I didn't select the correct viewport down here. And there we see the speakers are pumping out the music. So that's the beauty of a fully procedural setup. I hope you enjoyed this video and check out our other videos as well. We now have over 50 free videos, tutorial videos out there. Check them out. 
thinking particles, final render, final fluid. It's the most powerful visual effects tools you can get on 3D Studio Max. Thank you for watching this video. Hope to see you again. Goodbye.